Welcome to Streams of Income with self-help author Ryan Rieger. For the next hour, you'll hear proven methods for how to live the multiple income streams dream. Ryan is passionate about helping others discover their gifts and start their own business. He's published five books, and his courses and group coaching programs have changed the lives of thousands of students all over the world. Ryan's books include Private Label, The Easy Way, Finding Your Grace Place, and his latest, Streams of Income. And now, here's your host, Ryan Rieger. Hey guys, welcome back to the Streams of Income radio show. I'm your host, Ryan Rieger, and today we're chatting with my new friend, John Ostensen of Fran Bridge Consulting. John wrote a book, uh, just came out last October, called Non-Food Franchising. This is fascinating. I don't know that I've ever had anybody on to talk about the franchise model, but it's a viable stream of income. And he says you can actually, he's got six franchises that he runs as mainly an investor and he has people that run them for him so cool i think um i'm very much interested in what would take to add on a franchise or what i'm already doing and so steven and i were interested steven was my co-host for this episode because he always brings a a side to these interviews that i don't bring but this was a fascinating interview if you're interested in going down the franchise route knowing about um what types of franchises are hot what are the pros of a franchise versus starting from scratch? How to even run this semi-passive to where you could have a full-time job and create another stream of income just by having somebody run this for you, having a, a manager run it, and you just reap the benefits of it. Yeah, there's some work, so that's why he says it's semi, semi-passive. Um, why real estate investors are a good fit for this. If you're in real estate, you're a perfect fit for this. And we talked about like just some actual cost models, like what it might cost to um, to get a franchise, what the profit might be. He went over a use case of, of somebody that's doing really well with this. But this is a super cool interview. I really enjoyed getting to know John and I'm excited to bring it to you. Here it is. John, welcome to Streams of Income. Such an honor to meet you. Ryan, appreciate you having me. Love the show and excited to be here. Yeah, I love talking to, I, I was just, just had a episode right before this. Um, and one of the coolest things about being a podcast host is you get to meet amazing people. And uh, it's just, just so fun. Like, I think even if somebody, nobody was listening to these episodes, which <laughs> thankfully they are, I would do them because I just, it gets you the connections and build relationships with people that never would have met otherwise. So, so glad we got connected. But yeah, tell no. me your story, John. I love hearing people's stories. I know um, we're going to talk about franchising, and I'll get into that. But uh, what's? I mean, obviously, you probably have a fascinating story. I learned so much from people's business journeys and business nuggets, golden nuggets come out from that. But so, tell me how you got into what you're doing now. Well, I'll try to try to give you the uh, you know, the, the fast version here. So, yeah, based in Atlanta, Georgia, wife and three young kids here in Buckhead, and uh, been here for a good while. Um, but like so many of your listeners, started out in the corporate world and spent many years uh, was in with Accenture and consulting. Went back to business school like you're supposed to do, you know, after a consulting gig, and then um, you know, spent many years with Carter's Oshkosh Bagosh. Um, oh, cool! Never, never thought I'd be in children's apparel, but it's, it's the behemoth of uh, baby clothes. And so, <laughs> right? worked with some of the largest retailers in the country. Worked with the president of the company. Had some great exposure and experience, but uh-huh. you know, but like so many, had that more entrepreneurial itch and. Yeah. Um, you know, but just about seven years ago, decided to scratch it and didn't know what that looked like. Really stumbled my way into franchising, did not know what I was looking for, yeah. um, but had the opportunity to step away from a public company into a private company, that being Shelf Cheney Franchise System, uh-huh. and uh, had the opportunity to come in and serve as their president, uh, supporting all of our owners across North America. Wow. So for me, that was when I fell in love with franchising, where I really dug in deep, um, I just saw how it was a better path to business ownership for a lot mm-hmm. of these people that had a variety of different backgrounds and also opened up my eyes to this world of what I call non-food franchising. So mm-hmm. um, long story short, partner with the founder, we spun off, we've invested in franchises ourselves on the franchisee side. So I've been on you know both sides of the uh, equation there and, and still have those, of course. Um, but I've got good people running uh, the franchises for me and allows me to spend most of my time helping others do the same. And so yeah. um, end of the day, like we were saying before the show you know entirely free to work with Frambridge. you know there's no cost at all we are funded by the brands but we, we just so get cool. to play matchmaker all day and like you're saying we get to meet great people and then help them yes. find that that right opportunity in their market that, that fits them man are you allowed to or feel comfortable telling the the franchises that you own 
Yeah, uh, the driveway company, Pool Scouts, uh, recently invested in Everline. It's concrete paving, line striping, you know, these non-sexy, boring uh-huh. businesses. That's okay. where I love it. Yeah. Um, let's see, what else? I uh, In the process of purchasing foot solutions, custom orthotics and insoles. We've got uh-huh. them working on an investor model now, and I'm going to kind of uh, help them with that. So, wow. um, And then I'm invested at the franchisor level with one or two as well that are uh, upcoming franchisors. So that's, what does that look like practically? Is that like if I if I was the one that was saying, I'd be willing to, I want to run it. So I come your level, you're more the investor. I might come to you, let's say it costs 50 grand for this franchise. I don't have 50 grand. So I'll find two people that will invest 25 grand and you're one of those guys and you're kind of my mentor since you've done this before. Yeah, each, each each of the situations that I'm involved in there is a little bit different. And, mm-hmm. and we see that same thing play out with our clients. You know, there's several different ownership models in franchising. There's what's called an owner operator where you're running the day-to-day operations. Yep. There's what's called a semi-absentee or you'll hear it called semi-passive sometimes. Those are yeah. very common. Probably two-thirds of our clients are semi-passive. They keep the day job or they keep their focus on their existing business and they get another um, you know business going on the side of franchising. Yeah. And with those... Um, you know, it's essentially manage the manager. So you've got a general manager typically running your day-to-day operations. You're partnering with the franchisor. They can, the franchisor can serve as that technical resource, help guide them, answer their questions. So mm-hmm. it makes doing something like that doable. Wow. Um, and then there's a third model, which is very rare. It's it's kind of the holy grail, if you will. It's it's called a, a true investor model or passive model. That's mm-hmm. where the franchisor runs the business for you. Um, there's only a couple of companies doing doing that today. Okay, we've done deals with every one of them because our clients love that model. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's the one that I'm investing in uh, down in South Florida in a couple okay. of weeks as well. So, um, yeah, it's a beautiful model. I'm encouraging more franchisors to. Yeah, so is that the way? Like, if um, so then the the franchise or that company they find the runner, the the uh, owner, op- they find the operator for you, that general manager. Yeah. And they manage the day-to-day uh, overseeing that operator. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Wow. Man, oh man. That sounds and so as cool. you know, I mean, I, <laughs> we were talking before the show, you know, a lot of our clients are real estate investors as well. And they, you know, I think it's a, you know, I personally own real estate properties too. It's uh-huh. a portfolio approach. And I think with franchising, what it offers you is some of that active income. And you know, there, there's so many tax strategies that you can employ that you can't mm-hmm. do as W2. I love getting creative with my clients and sharing you know, some of what I personally do in that realm. And uh, happy That's to go awesome. down that path. I want to hear more about the. So there, I got lots of questions. Uh, what, uh, <laughs> I know Steven does too. So you, I'll let you go as well. Um, well, number one, I, I've always thought it'd be fun to have um and I know you we're talking about non-food here, but it would be fun if I owned a bunch of different restaurants I like to eat. You know, like I could walk into a restaurant and be like, I own this. And I but I don't really I don't run it at all. I want to be the shareholder. Or I have a friend that said be the um be the chairman of everything and the CEO of nothing. And that resonates with Steve and I. And that's what we want to be that way. We it's easy to be a, an entrepreneur. It's easy to start a business, but man, then you have to run it. Um, I want to be John where you are to where it's like, you just got people, you're just the investor and um, you know, you're letting them run it. So how, how do you get to the, the, tell me about the semi passive model. What does that look like? How do people find those opportunities? Obviously they go through you. Um, you know, what's that look like for somebody practically, you know, yeah. on a day to day, yeah, so Probably. we're affiliated with over 600 different franchise companies. You know, mm-hmm. in the world of franchising, there's about 4,000 franchise brands in the U.S. alone. You mm-hmm. take out food, you take out hotels, which we love those guys. We need them. We appreciate them. I just, my clients and I choose the easier path to business ownership in my humble opinion, <laughs> which is outside of food. So that cuts out about half of the market. And okay. then from there, we look at, you know, who are the best franchisors to have that track record on their leadership team of supporting successful franchisees financial model uniques within their industry. Um, mm-hmm. yeah, and then we do more deals than anybody else in the country on, on behalf of clients. Wow. And so we get to see firsthand what's resonating, why is it resonating? So we bring all that together, um, combined with what's available in our clients, uh, targeted market and, uh, you know, what their interests are, what their financial investment level is. Okay. And so we, we consult with them. We, and then we ultimately present to them, you know, roughly 10 opportunities that are, mm-hmm. you know, the ones that we think they should consider. We'll touch wow. on a few different industries, but, um, and from there they would pick a few 
to speak with, we would make introductions to the brands wow. and you know, they start the conversations. We hold their hand through the process, bring in uh-huh. funding partners or a franchise attorney or a recruiter, whatever they need, um, but essentially serve as their guide through the process. And okay. what's, what's so much fun is that about 90% of our clients end up in something that was never on their radar that they yeah. had never considered. You just don't know what you're looking for until it's right there in front of your face. Yeah. Um, so Give me an example of walking it. through that. Like you said, you pick boring things. Um, yeah. th- so these might be things that to you personally, you have no interest in the actual product. How do you, how does that jive with, you know, would it be, would it be better to have something that you like, I'm passionate about this product. So let's find a, a franchise opportunity that I really care about personally, or does it really not matter? That's a great question. And so I, I think to each his own, I mean, we do have some clients that say, Hey, I want something that I'm passionate about. Others say, Hey, I'm open-minded. And you know, if it requires the fewest number of employees and the highest return on investment and you yeah. know, le- least amount of headaches, then it checks all, all those boxes that a I'm pure open-minded. investor, <laughs> but yes. you know, a good example would be, um, and then I'll delve into the industries. You know, we work with a lot of doctors, a whole lot of medical professionals, high you know, paid uh, W-2s, they're not looking to leave their day job, but they want to get something going on the side. They want to flex that muscle of business ownership and learning Mm -hmm. something new. Mm -hmm. Um, Most of them say, hey, we're interested in health and wellness, but we're open-minded. Most end up buying like a property services business, something totally outside of their realm. And, And we, you know, when you look at the landscape out there, home and property services are probably about as attractive as any area the, you know, okay. variable cost models, you scale them up, whether it be gutters, dumpsters, insulation, concrete paving. I mean, uh-huh. that's why I would call boring business oil changes. Yeah. We do a lot of oil sure. changes. Um, we do a- have some great businesses in health and wellness. We're, we're not doing as much in fitness right now. I feel like that's a little bit of a crowded space, um, mm. you know, but it's things that are, are more needs-based versus discretionary. What's going to do well if, this recession we've been talking about for 10 years finally hits, you know, right. it, the things that people spend money on regardless, it's yeah. what they care about their kids, their home, know, their pets, their home, their health, their mm-hmm. aging parents. And so businesses that are positioned in those industries, I think fair to do well. And that's the, the, the non-trendy is the new trendy, if you will. Wow. Mm. Mm. Fascinating. You said something I, I want to circle back to so is you said you have a team is this something that doing all of this that you're doing, say for me to want to get into it, do is it a suggestion from you to have a team or are you saying that it's leveraging your team and then going in and making that matchmaking and then from that franchisor, you don't necessarily need a team? Right. So in the rare instance of that investor model where, again, there's only four or five companies out there doing it today, then the franchisor would have the team. For you okay in most cases 95 percent of the cases today awesome. you would be again either running the business yourself or hiring a general manager um yourself who you're putting you know sometimes you give them a little bit of equity sometimes you just give them a strong incentive program but someone that's going to act in your best interest to run the day-to-day and then yeah. you're serving as that chairman coaching that person yeah. assuming it's a good person now if it ends up not being the right person that's where a headache comes in you have to find yeah, the right person sure. do they um, help you find that person at the beginning in some cases, yes, I'd say in most cases, the onus falls a little bit more on you, but you yeah. know, they're telling you where to fish. They're giving you the job profiles. They're happy to also interview that person oftentimes. Yeah. Cause oh, that's wow. a very, 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 very key role. Cause I don't want to be like, Oh, that guy just quit yeah. today. I got to go run that, that, uh, tire shop. <laughs> and I don't know what I'm doing. Right. Exactly. And well, and hopefully you know enough to be dangerous. You dug in a little bit at the beginning, but, um, <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I could just just cite different case studies. I think of my client Nathan in South Carolina and kind of what he's built. He uh-huh. he's the largest franchisee of two men in a truck moving service, operates okay. in like 10 markets, 30 million wow. in your business. Well, yeah. he finds all these great folks in his church or in his community, brings them into the organization. They prove themselves supporting the bigger, the big entity there. Mm-hmm. And then he says, Hey, go make us proud and go launch this business for us. So Nathan and I do another deal every year where he'll promote someone like a 27 year old from his organization who's earned his trust and he'll actually give them equity out of the gate to say, Hey, go make us proud. And I think in every case he's come back and bought additional locations within the first year of the deals we've done. Yeah, man. I like that model. I do too. Bringing them in, building them up and then setting them off Yeah, and giving them equity, setting them up with that. Yeah. So you're kind of what we do in the online world. (laughs) 
Yeah, that's what I was gonna. We're not franchising it out, but it seems like this is a good fit for us and what yeah. we're building. The team yeah. for the semi passive. If I was trying to do something very similar to you, it's essentially I'm building a team because I'm gonna have to hire that operator, whoever's doing that. But then even a support staff for evaluating or stepping in, or if it, it needs to be some redundancy to just have somebody on staff that can go in general manage or something like that. Is that something that you also help with? No, that'd be a little more of the franchisor. So we kind of, okay. you know, take the pass the baton at that point when they decide okay. to move forward and sign the agreement, and we kind of tee up everything along the way, and then we kind of pass the baton to that franchisor. That being said, I love staying in contact with my clients and getting updates from them. And I mean, this past week, we had a client out of Philadelphia that just came back and bought another another franchise, and we just sold them one back in the fall. And so we we wow. have a lot of that repeat business. And, and so it's a lot of fun. That's where I get my validation. When I see the successes of, hey, they want to come back and buy another, or they want to come back and buy additional locations, which most do, or wow. they refer their brother-in-law, which I never know if that's a positive <laughs> or a negative, but in most cases, a positive, right? So, right. That's yeah, repeat awesome. this is Amazing. Was, uh, John, is it possible? Like you live in Atlanta, is it possible for you to run a buy and run a franchise where I am in Dallas, or does that make it really hard? Yeah, I mean the answer is it depends. I mean, you know, sure. common sense. I mean, it depends on the, the the business, how involved you need to be. Do you have someone yeah. good on the ground over there that you trust? I mean, that's what it comes down to. Sure. We do have a lot of clients. I just had a client this past week who lives in Jackson Hole, but great market, but not a great market for some businesses. Yeah. He bought a dumpster business down in Houston. Okay. And but he has a GM to run it. I'm headed down uh, to South Florida next week. Uh -huh. And again, this is that investor model, but for foot solutions, I'm going to be opening up a few locations down there because the demographics are better than the remaining territories here in the Atlanta market. Wow. That's awesome. Can we get into some of the, one of the questions on here? And I definitely want to, I always like getting practical. Um, like, give me some examples of like how much a franchise could cost. I know I'm sure it's all over the board, but maybe a, is there a case study without anybody's name of like, you know, Steve bought a franchise and, you know, <laughs> yeah. make up a name or whatever, but it costs him this much and he's you know, getting this type of a return. Um, he works 10 hours a week or a hundred hours a week because he's the owner operator. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, we could go down the list here all, all day with, you know, case studies, but yeah, you know, and I will say one of the nice things about franchising, you know, you don't have all of your questions answered, but you have a lot more questions answered going into that buying decision than you do yeah. just with a startup. You know how others in that system have performed in the past. You've got historical yes. numbers, if you will. Yeah. And then you've got, um, you know, just, and you get to talk to them ahead of time. You get to talk to those other franchisees, oh, awesome. do what's called validation. You also yeah. get the item 19 of the franchise disclosure document, which shows the financials from prior years. Yeah. Um, and so using that, um, you know, it is a good guide. You know, an example I oftentimes cite, and this is, you know, I'd say this one's a little more attractive than some, you know, but I'll just show you to kind of the potential all in investment at right around 200,000, which is where we see a lot of ours falling. Some will use SBA loans to fund it. Some will use an old 401k or IRA, yep. some, some use cash. But right around 200,000, all in that st you know, startup cost, franchise fee, working capital built in as well. Um, you know, that, that's in the property services realm. It's a gutter business, actually. Mm -hmm. um, gutter installs and such, which is about a $6 billion industry, highly fragmented out there. But 200,000, all in investment. Their average franchisee is doing 1.7 million a year in revenue. Wow. And what's really cool is like two years ago, that average was 1.2 million. So you're seeing good growth, um, good comp growth uh, within the system. But, but they're doing that at like a 27, 28% EBITDA bottom line margin. And so uh, I always tell my clients, hey, even though I think my clients are sharper than average and they're going to outperform uh -huh. the average, let's go in very conservative and say it takes longer to ramp it up than expected or it's going to, you know, we're not going to quite hit those numbers at least early on. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. Is there enough meat on the bone if we take a conservative approach yeah. to the average? And, and obviously in that case, in mo most people would say yes. Yeah. So not just to make sure for uh, for yeah. financial for dummies, Stephen understands exactly <laughs> what you said. But like if somebody's, if a business is bringing in 1.7 million and their margin is 30%, is that, just doing some quick math here on a calculator, $510,000 might be their net profit. Is that, yeah. that's after they pay the general manager um, okay, perfect. And so in that situation, I mean, I guess the owner could pocket all that, but more likely they're reinvesting or maybe they'll buy a new franchise or. They are. And that's not, that's, that's, those probably aren't your numbers in year one. Now that system has had franchisees do seven figures in year one. 
Yeah. So does the fast ramp up, but let's assume you get to that level in year two or year three. Yeah. Um, with that one, and this is interesting. So we've done, I think, nine or 10 deals with them now. We had a Wall Street attorney outside of Boston. We've had mm -hmm. doctors in Huntsville. We just had a doctor in Portland buy it. I mean, you're seeing kind of the geographic. We've had insurance guys in South Carolina. We've had you know corporate guys in uh, New Jersey. Now, have we done one in Southern California? We do a lot of deals in Southern California, not for this one, because it doesn't rain as much. And so sometimes there are some geographical considerations. Yeah. But for many of these, there's not a whole lot of variation. Interesting. So good. Steven, I know you got a question. <laughs> I was going to circle back to just like the, what you're providing and offering and then the franchise ors. It seems like it's a full stop service. Cause I thought you mentioned something about financing too. Like they kind of help you with that. So is, who is your ideal client that you're looking for? I mean, you just listed off the financial yeah. professionals or doctors and maybe high earners. Is there franchise opportunities for lower earners and or like business people that are focused on and might have a banger year and then they go, ah, now I'm ready for moving into this? 100%. Hey, I'd say on the lower end, you know, if your net worth all in isn't at least 100,000 or maybe 150, it's probably not the right time to buy a business. You know, let's save up a little bit more. Um, but most franchises have a net worth requirement, you know, the 200 to 500 range somewhere in that ballpark. And so it is very achievable for a lot of people. Yeah. I think the youngest client we ever did a deal with was um, 24 years old. And the guy is a rock star. He's come back and bought additional locations. It's just wow. done great up in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, you know, and then we do deals, you know, with folks in their 60s. I'd say, you know, probably most of our clients are in the 30s to 50s. And, you know, again, about one third of them are looking to make the jump full time. And oftentimes it's, hey, I want to go full time. I'm leaving my corporate world job. Mm -hmm. But over time, I want to replace myself and then move on to the next things. That That's oftentimes yeah. the mentality. Um, but two thirds are looking for that semi passive. And, you know, the goal is you know, they understand it's not a truly passive investment. There's going to be a little bit of a time commitment, but commitment but with a strong franchise door that's going to provide that support and a good general manager yeah. it is very achievable and again you get all those flow through benefits from a tax standpoint that's awesome well. what does semi passive like look like as far we quick question like as far as number of hours that somebody might if they have a general manager yeah. what is the you know the responsibilities that that person has and approximately what might that take yeah, when I've had good general managers and businesses, I mean, it's taking me five to 10 hours a week, and, you know, oftentimes five hours a week. Mm -hmm. I always tell my clients, if you think it's going to take 10, it's probably going to take 15, especially early <laughs> on. Um, so we, again, we try to go in eyes wide open and be conservative and make sure. And, you know, you do yeah. see a lot of couples as well, um, where maybe he'll do some of the bookkeeping, maybe she's at home with the kids, but she has some bandwidth to kind of do X, Y, and Z during the day. Yeah. Um, so that's pretty common as that's well. That's good. Steven, sorry to cut you off, buddy. Well, it was just interesting to hear you say, like, it, it seems like it's a repeatable system. Once you go into almost any franchise, it's like there's, they, as the franchisor, knows kind of the system. They're going to hold your hand through it. It seems like once you kind of go through it, if you do want another franchise into that same industry, it should be fairly easy for you to duplicate that system because yeah. you kind of know more of what it takes. But f I guess I am just unaware of is it mostly you working with the franchise or and starting like a new business? Or are you buying from people that have a franchise and wanting to sell that franchise? Or do you work with both? And what is the more common way of doing it? I'd say about 5% of what we do are resale deals where it's an existing franchise business that's running that we're you know shifting to a new buyer. So that, that We do some of those, but it's less common. Um, and part of that is because people hold on to these businesses for a while, oftentimes. <laughs> um, so idea. it's you, it's usually new territory for an established franchise business where they're moving into the market, or you may be the third or fourth entrant into that market, but there's still green space to be had. Um, you know, one thing that's interesting, there was a study done, is, speaking of resales, study done a little while back where they looked over 20 years at about 2,000, I'm sorry, over 10 years at 2,000 business transactions. Um, you know, exits. And they looked at franchise versus non-franchise and like kind industries. What they found were franchises traded at a multiple close to one and a half times non-franchise. So there um, is a value seen by that buyer when they purchase a business if it happens to be part of a franchise. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, because it's a proven system at yeah. that point. 
Yeah. And, and you run a risk when you come in and buy an existing business. What if the key employee leaves mm -hmm. or what if you lose a key customer, depending on the type of business? Well, you just yeah. paid a premium for that business, you know, versus starting something new. And so there, you run that risk. And I think there's a lot of comfort knowing that you've got a franchisor on the sideline that's there to support you. Nope. Mm. So that franchisor, I guess it always depends, but are they finding the land and building is it you're leasing that or buying and building? So I'd say probably two thirds of the placements that we've done in the last couple of years don't require a physical location. These are remote wow. businesses. Some of those property oh, wow. services ones that I mentioned, and ah, you know, okay. and if you do have a okay. physical location, it's just maybe an office, it's more back office type space. It's not customer facing retail where location matters. Uh -huh. um, but in the case that you do have a physical location, like a retail uh, footprint. The franchisor is absolutely there helping you. Like next week, I'm traveling with the CEO of Foot Solutions down to Florida. We're doing site selection. He's got me set up with their broker down there. We're going to visit seven or eight sites with the hopes of getting down to two or three. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but they bring in the experts. I mean, they know enough about what works for their business, but they bring in the outside real estate experts that you guys probably know more about than I do to complement that and help them with the mm -hmm. site selection and then with the build out. Yeah, they don't expect mm -hmm. the franchisee to know how to do that. I was just interested because there, there are lots that we have that sometimes we trade out. And I wonder if instead of just trading it out, if it's a, what franchise would work here instead of just like trading a lot out for something and make it a lot more lucrative or cash flowing for that piece of property. But it is interesting that you're saying that most of these franchises don't need a retail space because they can be run almost from anywhere. It's mostly the mobile vehicles that are going out. Yeah, it will. And a lot of them do have the physical location. It's just when I look at where the interest level has been, I think coming out of COVID over the past two to three years, uh, it's okay. been more of, hey, let's not lock ourselves into a lease. <laughs> that being said, a lot of what we do are what I'd call retail light, where maybe it's a 1200 square foot pad. You know, it's not a massive big box gym. Yeah, me and Ryan were looking at uh, ice machines. I don't remember if that was a franchise or not, Ryan. Um, but something like it that, where it's not. like you're in somebody not. else's parking lot. Yeah, yeah. Is there franchise opportunities like that, where it's like, oh, we pair nicely with this type of business? Yeah, you know, if you know people that own parking lots or landlords out there, um, there's an oil change that we, we had some clients buy into recently. They did 10 locations across the Southeast where um, it's almost like, um, modular uh, and they put these in parking spaces and unused parking spaces where you get great street visibility. You already have the built-in traffic flow, um, but it only takes up like eight parking spaces and it's a hmm. drive through oil change. And so um, um, you do see some ideas like that. I mean, people love these niches in different ways of disrupting hmm. industries. We, we had a client yesterday sign a deal and this, I think it was a fourth or fifth client getting into this one, but it's, it's a business that uses temporary walls around construction sites. And these could be like renovations in malls or hotels or doctor's offices and hospitals, or airports. You see these little construction sites all the time. You don't think about it, but they need these temporary walls to go around them. That's a great business model because they're not that hard to set up. You pay some guys to set it up and then you're collecting lease payments while those walls are in use. Yeah. And then you break them down at the end. Um, like Bob's Barrels. You ever mm. seen those Bob's barrels that are on the side of the highways that they lay out? They rent those barrels. They didn't always, know the I name of them, business. but yeah, certainly see them. I think I've probably hit a few along the way. <laughs> yeah, I always <laughs> thought of that as an amazing business. I'm like, that guy must be making a mint. Oh my gosh. So I got, John, I would assume like that it's non-food because the food business is just much harder. It's you know more likely to not do as well. Is that the reason? You know, it, it tends to be a little more brand driven, a little more yeah. uh, tr on trendy. You think about frozen yoga, for instance. Yeah. Um, you know, but it's also, in most cases, a larger capital outlay. It yeah. requires more lower wage employees. It's more yeah. operating hours. It, again, we need those guys. We appreciate those guys. But I just, my humble belief is they're easier ways. To yeah, exactly. High turnover. Those two probably a lot of the franchises that you're dealing with. Yeah. That's cool. Steven, what else you got? This is a good, I mean, I felt, well, John, one thing, John, we need to make sure is where can people go to find you? They want to know more information. They want to, you know, um, you know, hang out, get to, get to know you and learn about how they can become a franchise owner. 
Yeah, come out to our website, franbridgeconsulting.com. That's F-R-A-N, bridgeconsulting.com. And yeah, we'd love to offer a free digital copy of um, either audio or PDF to, of our new book, Non-Food Franchising. Free copy to all of your listeners. If you come out to our website, you should have a pop-up that uh, you know shares that offer. Um, I'll have my assistant reach out and make sure you get uh, copies. Awesome. Certainly, if you'd rather go to Amazon and purchase it, all profits go to a great charity that we support, Hope International. Oh, cool. So I uh, definitely know that you're sending it to a good cause if you go awesome. that route. Um, is there anything we didn't talk about that you think we really need to cover? Any, any These are a bunch of people. So um, yeah. been doing the podcast for three and a half years now called Streams of Income. So these are p- people that are either have a business or want to start a business. So it's actually ideal audience for you. Um, what else would you say to them that you feel like we haven't t- talked about? I think we covered a lot. I, you know, I just say we're seeing so much activity. Every quarter is breaking the records of prior quarters right now. I think there's just cash on the sidelines. We're doing deals at places like Seattle and Southern California and New York, places that don't get a lot of positive headlines. Wow. There's still really positive economic activity on the ground. So yeah. Um, yeah, I love seeing it. I feel encouraged at the prospects, you know, for our country, <laughs> you know, if we can get pol- politicians out of the way, I think that, uh, you know, there's a lot of great economic activity and people mm-hmm. are more interested in business ownership than ever before. So um, yeah, lots of positive activity. I'd encourage anyone that has an interest to jump in because our biggest challenge right now is the great opportunities to move fast in good markets. Yeah. Uh, so we're always trying to position our clients at the tip of the spear. Awesome. Well, John, thanks for being on with this. Very much appreciate it. Enjoyed it, guys. Thanks for having me. Of course. You've been listening to Streams of Income with self-help author Ryan Rieger. From right here in the Dallas Metroplex, Ryan teaches several entrepreneurial courses and group coaching programs to students all over the world. Be sure to listen next week at the same time for Streams of Income with Ryan Rieger.